church, we love God. Make no mistake about that. At our church, we believe Jesus is God. We're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. We believe that prayer moves the hand of God, and it's normal for every believer to be intimate with God and devoted to His cause. At our church, we believe the Bible is God's Word. It's real, it's living, and it's active. We believe freedom is the heart of God for every believer, and we value humor, simplicity, teamwork, and a positive outlook on life. At our church, we're about developing great relationships with God, each other, and those in our community. At our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that he really died on the cross, and that he really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and will not water down or candy coat that message, ever. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we're not concerned about where you've been, but where you're going. We believe that all people matter to God, therefore matter to us. Today, you have chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially life-changing message. Welcome, Welcome to, to our, our church. church. Love to give us each and every day for your, your many miracles, as Bruce was talking, Lord, that we receive every day. We don't even, uh, aren't even aware of, Lord. Um, Lord, you know, I had a flat tire the other day, and maybe you were taking me from an accident. Who knows, Father? Who knows? But Lord, I just want to thank you today and give you praise, honor, and glory. May we lift you up today in our praise and our worship. May our hearts be, be leashed on to you, God. May we be drawn to you, Jesus, in our thoughts, in our prayers, and in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's stand and give God... In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered together to lift up your name. Call on our Savior to fall on your grace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering As your saints bow down, as your people sing We will rise with you, lifted on your wings And the world will see that Our God saves Our God saves
then you prove You're the God who moves the mountains The God who moves the mountains You say
for our King is soon returning As we hold to this assurance Spirit come, Spirit Jesus' love 
that he fuels us up to where we can get to that point. But here's the thing, all he asks of us is to be willing to allow him to fill us so that in his strength we can forget. It's hard, especially when you think someone's when you know someone's done you wrong in that way. It's hard. But through Jesus' strength, we can get there. Amen? Okay. Um, let's uh, go on 16 through 18. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. For they neglect their appearance so that they will not uh, be noticed so that they will be noticed sorry by men when they are fasting so they they put on a gloomy face so everybody notice notice them truly I say to you they have the reward in full but you when you fast anoint your head wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Okay. Back in the ancient days, they used to, when, uh, when they fast, they wanted to look more spiritual. So what they'd do is they'd get ash, the white ash, and they'd rub it on their face to look more ghostly looking. Hmm. Then they'd wear... Uh, uh, morning clothes. Lots of times that was dark, you know, they covered over the head, put on that gloomy looking face that they were sad, sorrowful, pitiful looking things, you know. Oh, look at him. He's fasting for the Lord. Look how spiritual he is. And they did that. And they were really fasting to get closer to God. They were fasting to get noticed by men. There's a big difference. You see, you notice when it says, uh, only the hypocrites do that. But when you fast, God tells us how to fast. Wash your face. Fix yourself up. Look like you're happy. Put a happy look on your face. Maybe put makeup on. Do your hair. You know, wear bright, shiny clothes. Look the best you can look. Don't look the sorrowfulest you can look. We're not supposed to fast where everybody knows it. When we fast, maybe, I mean, when you're living with your husband or your wife, it, normally the wife cooks the meal, but in my case, sometimes my husband cooks the meal. So I'm going to have to say, you know, I'm, I'm fasting today, so please don't make me anything. Or, but they're the only ones that should even come close to knowing that we're fasting. We shouldn't go out there and tell our friends, I'm fasting today. Oh, call them on the phone. Hey, I'm fasting today, so don't come down to the house bringing a pizza. Or, you know, we're not supposed to go out and shout from the rooftop that we're fasting. It's supposed to be done in secret. It's supposed to be done to seek the Lord. It's supposed to be done to deepen our relationship to Him, to draw closer to Him. Um, it's a way to humble yourself to God. In Joel uh, 2, 12 through 13, it says, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, and with fasting, weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting, and, uh, relenting of evil. So what's he saying that fasting's for? It's returning to God. It's returning your heart to God. You see, as humans, we get so caught up in the world that we live in that we're not as close to God as we should be. We've got to work. We've got to take care of the kids. We've got to take care of the husband. We've got to work. <laughs> take care of the kids. Take care of the husband. Fix the car. Fix the house, mow the yard, do all the chores that's involved in all those things. And lots of times, who falls by the wayside? God. 
It's like he's last on our list instead of first on our list. I think it needs to be flip-flopped around. It's hard to get people together uh, for a prayer meeting, let alone a fasting time. I remember for a while when we first started the church, down when we were downtown in the little storefront, we started a women's prayer meeting, and it was called WOW, <coughs> Standing for Women of Wabash. And we couldn't get hardly anybody to come. So then we started having it more in the neutral place where it wasn't more like a denominational thing. We started having it at the Y, which for a while went really good until they started forgetting that we booked that spot for the night to prayer. And, uh, and then after a few times, people quit coming because it's like they could, never knew if the room was going to be there or not. So, you know, um, and then to rent another building, you have to pay a certain amount of fee. We are little. We didn't have the funds at that time. So it just kind of fell apart. But getting people to come to a prayer meeting is kind of hard. To keep it up, they come once, and it's like, yeah, I don't want to go no more. I'll just stay and watch TV. Yeah. And uh, so, remember, um, I forget his name. He calls his church to a 21 day fast every year. Uh, Frank? Is it Frank? Joseph Franklin. Jim, Joseph Franklin. Yeah. Well, I have part of it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he calls his church to a fast every year. And it's not just a one day fast, it's a 21 day fast. Now, the ones who can do it, they participate in that every year. I know there's some that can't because of health reasons. And, uh, you know, sure, I mean, she can't. Things like that, you have to keep up on. Um, uh, but if, if we would put seeking God and getting closer to Him and His presence as an importance in our life, we'd see big changes. Not only in our lives and in our families' lives and in our churches' lives, but we'd see them in the world, in the world today. In 2 Timothy sorry, 3, 1 through 3, it says, But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossip, without self-control, brutal haters of good. Um, you know, we don't have to look very far, far to see that we have that in the world today. When some, someone loves themselves and puts their wants above, that's serving themselves. Oh, I want that, so I'm going to go buy it. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Um, we become lovers of ourselves when we put our own wants over someone else's needs. Oh, I want a new, brand new $800 computer, but someone across the street may be living on their last dollar and need groceries and the kids are crying because they're hungry and do I really need a brand new $800 computer, you know? When we do that, we hurt God. I literally think we hurt Him. Because we're not living by what His teachings teach us. We, we then become followers after ourselves instead of followers after Christ. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 says this. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equal, equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
we're actually called to emulate um, the self-sacrifice. To sacrifice of ourself. Self-denial. The only way to be happy, I think. I mean, really happy in life is to give of yourself to others. It, it's to joy spell Jesus, others, and then you. We're last. We should always be last on the list, not first. We forget that sometimes. Oh, God loves me, so he wants me to have this, so I'm going to go buy it. <laughs> Maybe not. Self-control is one of the most precious gifts of the Holy Ghost, I think. I mean, he gives us lots of gifts, but self-control is one of the big ones. And it's knowing when to buffet your body and say, No, you can't have that. Chocolate cake might look good, but no. I said no. Oh, but I want to. No, no, no. And I'm actually going as far as slap my hand. Yeah. <laughs> because you got to say no sometimes. It's funny, when I was doing this, I had just got done eating a bowl of cereal last night when uh, I had already ate dinner. I didn't need the bowl of cereal. I just wanted something crunchy. You know how you just want something crunchy? And uh, so, so I uh, was studying this after I already ate it. I'm like, uh, I'm going to use that self-control a little while, a, bit, a little earlier, you know. But uh, we're, we're called to be, uh, emulate Jesus. And joy is not, not, it doesn't mean we're laughing all the time. We go around laughing all the time. Joy means that we're happy in our hearts because we know we're saved by the grace of God. And he has us, and we belong to Him. And because we belong to Him, we serve others before we serve ourselves. It's like when you go to a table. A mother usually will always serve her children, her husband, before she serves herself. You have to take on that, that role of it. You always serve the other person. Before you serve yourself. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 said, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So that tells us to be an imitator of Christ. He gave himself up for us. It wasn't just giving of his time, which he did. People followed him all the time. He was never hardly ever alone. He had to kind of sneak to be off by himself. He got alone by himself to do what? Pray and seek God. So should we. Get alone by yourself. Pray and seek the Lord. Now, the Apostle Paul said that, well, in a way, he said this. He says, I beat my body daily <laughs> to make it come under submission. What was he really saying there? He makes himself say no. Because our flesh cries out for different appetites, you know. One person might have the appetite of, of eating. Food's their, their struggle. One might have the appetite of, uh, I don't know, collecting cars. Things might be their struggle. It might be like the next boat, Har, uh, Harley Davidson, or the next boat, or the next Mustang, or Corvette, or, you know, the collecting of things. And, and one might be uh, lust. You know, the lusting after different women or different men or, or maybe it's pornography. Things that we shouldn't be doing. Our flesh cries out and we have to make it come under submission. We have to tell ourselves sometimes to have that control. No, Roxanne, I said no. 
Now, if you if you even <coughs> try it, I'm going to smack your hands. You better listen. You know, I can remember as a mother, my little girls would be getting Now, I said no. Now, if you go get that, I'm going to smack you. I'm going to smack your hand. I'm going to smack your butt. Now, I said no. Sometimes we have to do our own self that way. No. Now, I said no. You don't really need that. You just want that. And I've gotten something before and then turned around and been so under conviction over buying it <laughs> and couldn't return it that, you know, I felt like I got a whipping. And I did. That's how it was. I got a whipping from the Holy Ghost because sometimes we don't need stuff. We just want it. I'd rather be a help in this world, not a, not a, a, a problem. I'd rather be able to help someone rather than be a problem to them. But sometimes, now let's look at that in a different way. Sometimes to be a help and what gets done a absolute lot is that we try and help people uh, who have addictions and instead we end up enabling them to keep living the way they're living. Because believe me, you, ones that are out there that are in recovery or in addiction, maybe drug addict, I don't know. Um, they're manipulators, and they have learned well. And I can say that because I used to be one. <laughs> so they know how to get around the Christian, how to get around the church, how to get around the program. They know all the right answers. They've been in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out enough they learn from the best of the best. So they got they got it down. So sometimes what ends up happening is that we end up enabling. And we don't want to do that. We want to be wise as serpents, as the Bible says. And ask the Lord to give you uh, the spirit of discernment to be able to discern. Okay, 19 through 24. I just got one more thing to say about uh, fasting. Um, you know, when we fast, it doesn't necessarily have to be food. It doesn't necessarily have to be a drink. Even though when, when it talks about fasting and the norm, it was considered food in ancient days. But if you really think about this world and what has really kind of taken over uh, our children and society is more of the tech now, the fast food of technology. I mean, you can't hardly look anybody face to face anymore. I mean, if you walk up on them, you can't look at them face to face because they're like this. I mean, they're like this. You can't even look them in the eye because they might look up for a second, back down. Look up, back down. And, and it's sad. Or, or maybe the TV. You can't get their attention because they're watching TV all the time. Mm. That's technology, too. Uh, or, or maybe the computer. Maybe they're on the computer all the time, new, just doing stuff. They just like to play. A lot of people I talk to, they like to play solitaire on computers or, you know, the games, the computer games. And then the kids, what about the, the what do they call them, things? I don't know. But they play the games on mm. the little kids kids things or or they play Xbox or whatever. I mean they're and usually it's bad games, it's lots of killing in it, and I don't consider that something that a child should be playing because all it does is teach them how to kill. Well um, or maybe it's just something as simple as um, turning those things off for a day. Nothing wrong with, oh, well, here's another one, Facebook. Everybody's into Facebook. You can fast Facebook for a day a week. Fast your iPhone for a day a week. Yeah. Fast TV for a day. Fast the, the video games. Some people, if you ask them to fast their phone, oh, no, they say, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to fast Facebook. But those 
those are things that take our time away. One of the main reasons why I, I will just post something, uh, like a picture on Facebook, but I don't really get on there and really look to see what everybody's doing, unless I really want to know something in somebody's life, um, I hardly ever get on Facebook anymore and hang around there because when I do, I hang around there and it will go on for hours. That's a waste of time to me. I could be doing something productive. So uh, I don't, I try not to stay on there, but you know, we can fast TV for a day. And we should do that. And then work on the belly after that. <laughs> okay. 19 through 24. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then, the light that is in you is darkness. How great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So here God is kind of talking to us about what our treasure should be. As people... Uh, when we have something nice, we like to take care of it, don't we? We cover it up, lubricate it, grease it, oil it, put rust repellent on it. Whatever we need to do, take care of it. We take care of it, shine it up and polish it maybe. Uh, uh, we feel we have to look like so-and-so sometimes. All, all the new stuff, all the new gadgets, all the new iPhones, all the new computers, all the new style boats, new style motorcycles, new style cars. We, we feel like we have to keep up with the neighbors across the street. But no, no, we don't. We don't. I don't think Jesus lived a life like that. I think he lived a pretty humble life. Um, Christians are called to turn away from the so-called normal of the world. You know, we look around today and we think we have to have the latest fashions or the latest trends that go on. But we really don't. It too will pass. It's a trend. Hey, bell bottoms are coming back. We used to wear those in the 70s. <laughs> 60. 62, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, I'm going to ask you a question. What's your treasure? What is your treasure, if I ask you that? First thing that comes to your mind, that's your treasure. First thing that comes to your mind, that's your treasure. What is your treasure? Uh, Will Rogers Anybody remember Will Rogers? You know, you're down your age. Will Rogers said this. He said, advertising is the art of convincing people to spend money they don't have for something they don't need. How do we keep our heart from being captivated from these kinds of uh, influences today? How do we do that? It all, absolutely all lies where our treasure is at. And I, uh, you know, I thought about this. You know, as a pastor, your treasure is in Jesus and your people. As a person, my treasure is in Jesus. But I like technology stuff. I'll have to admit that. I really do. And um, sometimes I can put that first. I'm being honest. You know. Sometimes I can put that first. So how do we change that up? 
How do we let our treasure be our utmost Jesus? Because, you see, technology, this computer is going to, in about three years, be obsolete. Need another one. Uh, a, a Corvette or a motorcycle or a boat or uh, any object that's a material thing that you just put your prized possession in, that is going to rust away one day. And that's going to be voided. And it's not going to last forever. But what, if, what if you say your treasure is your child? Because that would be probably second. My, my kids, you know, my grandbabies, they're important to a mom. There's... I don't know if there's, I mean, I know fathers love their kids. Don't get me wrong. I know they do. But to a mother, she carried them babies for nine months, and she went through all that. She knows what it's like. So uh, her treasure can be in her kids. So how do we make sure our treasure is where it should be at? Our treasure needs to be in the things above needs to be in Jesus. Now, why do I say that? Everything else on this world is going to perish. Absolutely everything. Where store up treasures here on earth is not going to do us any good because we're going to get our praise here on earth. What we need to store up is our treasures in heaven. See, that's the thing that's going to last for eternity. That's the thing that's going to keep going on forever and ever and ever. And if your children are right with God, you're going to be with them forever too. See? Yes. I think, you know, you're talking about your treasures. I think, you know, God has no problem with you treasuring your kids or your spouse or your, you know, the different things you've mentioned. Houses, your cars, your whatever it is that you really do like, as long as you remember, number one is who gave you them, who gave you the ability to have them, and to understand that, you know, like money, you know, not to be prideful with them, but give glory to God that He allowed you to have those kids, He allowed you to have those, you know, houses. You know, I I was thinking when you were talking about that, it's like. So many people these days, and, and I, I guess I realize it because my home needs a lot of fixing. If you're ever at my place, you know that it's not a real fancy house, and it needs a lot of fixing. But I mean, glory to God because I have a home. I have a house that shelters me. I look around the world and see how many people I have food. You know, and I think God wants those things, but we have to remember who gives us the ability to have those things, you know. I think of the scripture where God tells the Israelites when he leaves them, leads them into the promise, maybe he says, you know, you know, you make wine from grapes that you didn't plant, you'll harvest wheat that you didn't sell, you know, you live in a fancy home that you didn't build, and then he says, then you'll say, look what I do. Mm -hmm. And not give glory to God. He says, then I'll turn my back on So, So, I mean, that shows me that God wants us to have Amen. nice things and, and those things. You know, and he wants us to enjoy them, but we need to give him the glory for it. You know, and to give him, you know, to tell people, you know, look what God has given me. Look what God's been, enabled me to have. You know, look what, you know, because, like I said, I think he wants us to have those things. But I think he wants us to put them in perspective. Just like, I see the ice please drive me crazy. It's kids first. I'm like, no, it's not kids yeah. first. I love my kids. I die for my kids. It's God first. But it's Jesus first, my spouse second, mm -hmm. then my kids. And if I put them in this order, I'm doing the best thing possible <laughs> for my kids. <laughs> you know, and, and like I say, you know, people just, you know, they get it out of order. So, you know, and it's, it's Jesus first. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hear me? I'm still blowing. Yeah, I'm sorry. Way down. <laughs> <laughs> Dogs are way <waiting. laughs> But like I said, you know, I, I think we got to keep in perspective and, and, and realize that God's given us these things and He's died for us to have. But I also think that He, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you can't get with me. Well, he's giving away all the things God's given him three, two times, and every time God gives you more stuff back when you put it in perspective. 
God gave us good things. Everything that we own or possess is going to rot away one day, but when we store yep. our treasure in heaven, and really what that means is what Bruce just yeah. said, number one needs to be Jesus. Number one. You know, it needs to be put in perspective that he's first, then everything else comes underneath him. Yeah. If we make him our treasure, our main treasure, the kingdom of God, then he is going to allow everything everything else that we need to be provided. You see, it seems like that, uh, oh, well, let me say this first. One of the wisest men in the world, who was that? Solomon, yeah. right? In Ecclesiastes 5, 10 through 11, it says this, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with it, with its income. This too is vanity. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to their owner to their owners except to look on? What what he's saying is um, those who are rich and have lots of money only want more money. And those who have an abundance of things and collectibles all always want more. They're never satisfied with enough. It's more, 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 more. So, but yet, if we desire God first, He supplies the rest for us. And He will give us an overabundance in heaven. I see Brother Solomon here. Most people don't realize I got all that wealth. God gave it to him. Why did God give it to him? Because when God asked him whatever, he could have whatever he wanted. Just say it, you know. He wanted to know how to rule the people justly. You know, be just and being kind and everything to the people. How to be a good leader, a good king. And because he didn't ask for that wealth or all might or any of those things, but put others first, God gave him another. You know, it's like, he gave them all of them. Yeah, he gave it all to them. He didn't ask for himself, he would ask them for others. And maybe one of the best learning lessons of all, he gave him everything. <laughs> he gave him everything. So he, believe me, you, along the lines, he learned. Because everything uh, is in vanity, he said, except for knowing, knowing him and the one who created you and, and, and gives blessings upon us. Uh, 25 through 34. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, and they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to their life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow, is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith, do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So what he's saying here is, basically through this whole part of Scripture, you know, seek him first. Seek his kingdom. Seek to know him. Seek his presence. Let him be your, your treasure. And then he will add all these other things unto you. It's a promise of God. If we put him first. Um, don't be worried about how you're going to get all this stuff. Because when we're worrying, 
really worry is just fear. And when, we're, when we are worrying and being fearful of not being able to pay our bills, how am I going to buy those clothes? Uh, I, I, my, my shoes have holes in them. How am I going to get a pair of shoes to wear? When we're worried about all that stuff, we're really not trusting God. We're really doubting Him. We're really not putting our faith in Him that He's going to come through for us. So, uh, fear is a liar, right? Remember that song? Fear is a liar. Fear is a liar. And we know His name. And He's the enemy of our souls, right? He's a liar today. And you ever see a bird? Do you ever watch a bird? The Lord says don't take care of the birds. But that, you know, everybody quotes that scripture all the time to others. And yeah, 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 I've heard it all the time. But if you ever step and watch a bird, they're always busy. <laughs> I mean, they're looking around all the time, flapping, going here and there, and then they fly off to somebody's house. And then they do the same thing, looking, watching, and, and then fly off, and they're looking and watching. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're hungry. Yeah. But they're always uh, looking and they're watching. And um, they're, they're not worrying. They're looking and watching for their food. They're looking and watching for a little movement down on the ground. A little worry pop up or something. Or maybe... Somebody drops a crumb of bread, or maybe something falls from a tree. I mean, they're looking and watching continually for their food. We can learn a lot from a bird. Maybe we should be looking and watching a lot for our food. Our food from heaven. Our food from God to feed us. You know, you can get a word from the Lord in the most weird places. You might just, you know, get a cup of coffee and Go out and sit on the swing in the morning and, and not even just looking out the trees, what you do every morning or whatever, and then all of a sudden God speaks a word to you because a butterfly flew across in front of your face or something like that. Just something you think about, and then God just speaks. And then we start seeking our food from Him, not from ourselves. Let him be number one. I remember there was almost a year of my life where I suffered from panic attacks all the time. I was afraid to go outside. Um, I, I know when I was trying to work through this, I would take small trips like, you know, I think I feel pretty good today. I'm going to try to get to the grocery store and pick up just a few things. And, and I'd go and I'd have the grocery cart. And, and then it never failed, there'd be like a line. So I'd wait for a little while, and then all of a sudden, someone would get behind me. And then I had a line in front of me, and then more people would get behind me. And then there'd be one coming on the side. <laughs> and I would just, I couldn't be in a crowd of people. I'd just start to panic. And I, lots of times, I'd just push my car off and just go on home. Drive as fast as I could to get home. I, I, I get to where I couldn't breathe and I'd start hyperventilating. My heart would be racing and the migraine would set in. It was horrible. It was the most terrifying thing I'd ever been through in my life. You know, it was panic attacks. You see, mine went into full blown anxiety. And, uh, and uh, you know, my, my eyes would twitch, my lips would go numb. I mean, it physically started to affect me. So how did I learn to overcome those things? You see, that was just attack from the enemy. You know, it's an attack from the devil. Um, how do you overcome those things? You have to focus your mind on the one that can truly help you, and that's Jesus Christ. You have to teach yourself to breathe correctly for one thing. That's a big one. You have to teach yourself how to calm down. But when you focus on something else, get your focus off, your heart racing, get your focus off, I can't breathe. <sighs> you have to get your focus on something else. And that's hard to do when your heart's racing and you feel like you can't get your breath. It's very hard to do. But what helped me a lot was 
putting on a worship CD, listening to Southern Gospel helped me. I don't know why. The Southern Gospel there. What I did, you guys, you know me best. Um, uh, this has nothing to do with the panic attacks, but you'll see me walk around with Bluetooth in my ear all the time, you know, and, and people have asked me, why do you wear that thing all the time for? I mean, you just always have it in your ear. I'm like, well, I'm not always have it to drive in a car, or I don't always have it on to get a phone call coming in, and yeah, it does help. You can work and actually talk to somebody on the phone if you use your hands while you're working. You can talk to them while you're working, so you don't have to ever lose a call. <clears throat> but what I use it a lot for is just to listen to scripture. Because see, you guys have heard me say this before, and you know me now, I am very forgetful. <laughs> There's been times I forget to even ask Bruce to come up here and give a scripture. I mean, come on. I'm very forgetful, and it's not something that I can control. People get mad at me, um, you know. At, I wish, and they say you just do that on purpose. No, I don't. I really don't. But it's, and it used to really bother me to the extent I would just cry about it all the time. I'd be like, God, why is my memory so good? <laughs> you know, why? Why am I like this? You know, why are you calling me to do this? Why? Because I suffer from the problem, but I'm not claiming it to always be that way. God is my deliverer, but um, it used to really bother me to the fact that I would cry over it. It doesn't bother me like that anymore, because if if others have a problem over it, over that's their issue, not mine. Because see, I'm not going to live in that kind of fear anymore of what someone thinks of me. I'm not going to live there anymore. What's important to me is God and that I do what God's called me to do and that I help others and that He's the number one source in my life. That's what's important. And I hope and pray in your life that you can say He's the number one treasure in your life. Make him the number one treasure in your life, and he will give unto you everything he's promised he would. Amen? Let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for this teaching. I want to thank you, Lord, for your beautiful, wonderful word. I want to thank you for the many here today, Lord, and that uh, they're uh, so close to, to us, Lord. And I want to thank you and ask that you bless their lives with abundant joy, riches, Lord, and, and uh, health, Father God, and shine your face upon them, Lord, as we lift up your hands. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come fly
to be 